I never wanted to be a father. I wanted to ride my motorcycle, hang out with my musician friends, my dirty girls. I wanted to travel and write stories. I went to Tahiti to hunt for Marlon Brando. I lived with Palestinian refugees in the Gaza Strip. I went to porn sets, writing about the life of John Holmes that became the movie Boogie Nights. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I sacrificed everything that I knew to get it. Left law school after three weeks at Georgetown. It's a pretty good place. I ended up as a copy boy at the Washington Post. Eleven months later, Bob Woodward, fucking Bob Woodward, <laughs> is giving me a promotion. I became a reporter. Over the next six years, I had a really great education in journalism, and I left and eventually landed at Rolling Stone. It was the beginning, it was during the drug war, and I was the drug correspondent. I partied with Rick James, <laughs> who never said I'm Rick James, bitch, by the way. <laughs> Although after it was said on TV, he started saying it. Now I lost my train of thought. I, uh, I went to parties with Mick Jagger, Yoko Ono, all these people. I had a pretty exciting life. I used to like to joke to people that I had this one little spindly yucca tree in the window of my house, and I'd be gone for like weeks at a time, and it would never get water, but somehow it would live. And so I would say, oh, I just guess it wanted to live with me. It's my only dependent. Thing was, is the glamorous life of a journalist could get a little lonely. Um, there was no one to hug. There was no one to share with. You can be like a crazy artist guy, but I think you're still like a real human being underneath. And running around is not enough, plus it might kill you. I met this woman, I fell in love. I thought she was my missing piece. On my 35th birthday, I had a big party, and I proposed to her because she was what I wanted. And then she went back to work as a waitress in LA, and I jetted off to my next assignment in Pensacola, Florida at a swingers convention. One of the first things I saw was this guy with green teeth. You go and get with my wife, ain't you? <laughs> Let me tell you something I've learned. Men, they want love because they want to hug, they want to share stuff, they want to date, but mostly they want to get it in. <laughs> Women want to do all that stuff too, but there's a whole lot more that when you're like in your 20s, you think you can control. I don't want to have kids. Yeah, we don't have to have kids. After you get married, you figure it out. You got no control. So, we were supposed to be on the five year plan. We were going to like live different places, do all this stuff, travel. But pretty soon it was like, I want to have a baby. And you know what? There's like nothing you can do, you know? Unless you don't want to do nothing. <laughs> so, uh, so, I was going to be a father. I was 36 years old, 30, almost 36. And so began the parade, the endless parade, the security consultant who told us we had to put the little things in the, in the 
socket so the kid wouldn't electrocute itself, and then you had to put all the, the locks on the toilets because they would like dive in. This guy was like a fucking Saturday Night Live skit. <laughs> and then he'll fall down the steps and do it. So we had gates everywhere. You know, I had my like really cute Victorian house in DC, and the guy's like, you know, putting in the, the things. And the books, the endless books, what to expect when you're expecting, you know, in 42 different ways, all in the same language, saying different things. And all it seemed like was the entire, as her tummy grew, with so many different salves and all the cocoa butter and everything, you know, all the shit that had to be done. As her tummy grew, my life got smaller and smaller until it was just this size. And then, you know how like the navel pops out? I had this notion one night that I have to say my dad was an OBGYN, so I have these weird, like, you know, medical notions, but I had this notion that the navel that popped out was like this weird cervical cap that was covering our relationship and all everything that we did. Like the cone of silence. <laughs> then the fucking baby comes. Like I said, my dad was an OBGYN, I delivered babies, I knew the whole thing, but uh-uh. I didn't know anything about bringing it home. Now, I've taken allergy pills, gotten allergy shots, and to this day take all this crap that they tell you to take to keep my nose from being stuffy. Well, the first night at home, you know, we got the bed, it's the, the queen-size bed, there's the two of us, and then there's the baby, and the baby has a stuffy nose and I was sure it was going to die. I could not sleep. And I'm like pissed. I'm fucking pissed that this woman got me into this thing where I, all I had was a spindly yucca plant that didn't even require water. That was my dependent. And now this fucking kid may die. <laughs> and I'm in charge. Because she was asleep. I don't know, I think she was tired, clearly. <laughs> we were all tired. So, uh, and it just got worse from there. You know, it was like the play pens, you know, the things to put together. You know, I'm a fucking writer. String, tape, and a checkbook, that's basically my toolbox glue, you know? Um, all this stuff to put together, everything to do, the bag of stuff that you had to carry everywhere you went, with the potions and lotions and diapers, and on one quite memorable occasion at Heathrow Airport, where I was pulled over with a gallon Ziploc baggie full of a white crystalline substance that I swore was formula. <coughs> Thank God that the customs official assigned to strip search me was himself the father of a young child and understood when I told him that my wife thought that they wouldn't have formula in England. <laughs> and it used to be, I want to do what I want to do. And it had become in my mind, no wife, no life. What's in this for me? What about my fucking needs? Like all I'm doing is running errands, getting shit that needs to be gotten. Like, what am I getting out of this? Well, you know, I'm an artist and no one was paying any attention to me if it wasn't baby related. And I decided, all right, all right, I'm gonna get myself, I'm gonna do a project, I got a project, I'm gonna write a book. And the main character is gonna be this father suffering this sort of 
postnatal something. I don't think they have a disease for fathers. Do they have a disease for fathers? But he was suffering it. And so, what he decided is the postpartum depression, male postpartum depression, let's call it something, Dr. Oz. <laughs> male postpartum depression. And this guy would live a double life. And by day, he'd do all the work, and he'd do everything that a family would require of him. And then by night, except fall down, and then by night, he'd be out on the streets of Washington undercovering the seedy side, discovering what does happen to a person when you take away all pleasure, <coughs> prohibition, when you prohibit everything, what happens? And wouldn't it be interesting if this main character smoked crack while he was doing this double life? Hmm, I am a journalist, something I could do. As it turned out, I had this bank account. A couple years before, I had a contract for a book, 13 grand. And uh, the book didn't work out, and uh, because it was my first book, I was kind of scared, so I didn't spend it. Novel. I offered it back to the guy. And once he kind of picked himself off the floor, a writer offering money back, he said, keep it, you might use it. Well, I used it. For the next three months, I smoked it all. And not only did I smoke it, I smoked it with the intention of smoking only until someone figured out what I was doing. No one fucking knew. I had a meeting at the Washington Post with my old friend, the publisher, and smoked crack in his bathroom. Nobody knew. Some of the other stuff that I did, well, I don't know if you know Washington, D.C. Any town's the same. There's a lot of trouble to get into a lot of dark side to explore. I explored it. And then one morning, I was woken by this odd sensation, these little feet kind of running on my back. And I wake up, and it's my wife, and my son's about tw uh, 12 months old, 13 months, and everything was the months. Fucking, when are the months going to be over? Can it be years yet? And they're both like, kind of playfully waking me up, waking daddy up, which was weird because there wasn't, you know, from my point of view, there wasn't a whole lot of let's be nice to daddy stuff ever. And I guess maybe, you know, my wife had thought, God, you know, he's doing all this shit for me all the time. You know, we'll be nice and. So she wakes me up and I, I roll over and she really was a beautiful woman and um, I loved her very much and which was probably one of the reasons why men feel so lost during this period of time because they don't have any more of the woman that they once loved, their partner. But then I looked at the clock. It was 11 fucking o'clock in the morning. I was two hours late for my flight. I had a bag packed in the closet that we shared, and I knew I told her I was going. She did me a favor and turned off my alarm clock. Well, right there at that moment in my mind, wasn't that the fucking absolute metaphor for this whole thing? I mean, giving me a son, that was supposed to be something nice, right? This was not nice for me. And nobody ever told me it wouldn't be nice. And I was pissed. And you hear me now, right? I'm a little guy, but I got a loud voice, and I started yelling at her. I was yelling. I was mad. It was like 20 cents. The kid was 
12 months, 13 months, plus nine months of pregnancy. It was like, it was up to here. And I started yelling at it and complaining. My life, no wife, no life. What's in this for me? What about my fucking needs? Whatever happened to I want to do what I want to do? Who the fuck was driving this train? I was bringing in the money. And I looked over and my son, he looked up at me and started crying. And I reached for him and he recoiled from being hard. And he went to his mom. And that's when I realized it's not about me anymore. <laughs>